The Variety Artist, Episode 6. This one's all about booking and performing fairs and festivals. But before we start the show, I just want to tell you how happy I am about where this podcast is going. It's now being downloaded and listened to in 22 different states in the U.S. and eight different countries all over the world, including Spain, Switzerland, China, and Japan. And I only launched two weeks ago. People are sharing, downloading, telling friends I couldn't be happier. And I have you to thank. I just want to take a minute to thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for telling your friends. I'm excited for where this is going, and I appreciate you for listening. Now let's start the show. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. Our guest this week calls Orange County, California home, but specializes in performing at fairs and festivals all over the Western United States performing as Sadie the Balloon Lady in Sadie's Farmtastic Adventure and Safari Sadie's Rubber Jungle Review. She delights young and old alike. Variety artists, I give you Becky Goodyear. Hey, everybody. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for doing this. <laughs> We're going to get into all the fairs and the festivals and all that kind of jazz, but tell me a little bit about your home life. What does it look like at your home? Pretty normal. Um, we don't have balloons and clowns all over the place. I was actually born and raised in Michigan, and we lived in a really small neighborhood out in the country. Mm. And I was the official organizer of the backyard circus every summer. And I assigned the roles to the other kids and putting together the show. And of course, I was the ringmaster. Oh. So our audience was the younger kids and their moms. Somehow we always wound up with cookies at the end to reward us after the show. <laughs> so you had a backyard circus? Yeah, every year. It was lots of fun. We just had a great time. <laughs> so and... people from all over the neighborhood would come around for Becky's Backyard Circus? Yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't call it that. I tried to be a little shyer about it than that, but I was truly in control. Um... <laughs> that, that sounds like a show. Becky's Backyard It was. It was a riot. So fast forward, and we moved to California in 1975, my husband and I, and we had a plan to only be here for two to three years. Mm. Well, so much for that plan. What we made you decide to move? It was time to leave because of options held out to us, um, Southern California, and some particular schooling was where we needed to come. So well, we, we were only going to stay long enough to get this schooling, and then we were going to be gone again. Well, we found that we needed to stay here. This was, this was where God wanted us to be. So We do have the weather. Yeah, there's that too, huh? <laughs> yeah, you could, do, you could do Becky's Backyard Circus all year long. No kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have been married coming up on 46 years. Oh. Yeah. In fact, I tell everybody that I was really only 10 when we got married. So don't do the math. <laughs> Greg, who's my husband, has been the most supportive man I could ever have thought possible. And I would never have struck out on this crazy adventure of being a performer without his encouragement. Well, well does he travel with you or, or how does that work out? Once in a while, he owns his own business. He's a CPA. How's okay. that for a combination? Wait a minute. I, we're, we're recording this on April 18th, so he just finished tax season, right? I know. So he got a he got a, a back rub last night, and um, nice. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> it was it was pretty grueling this year with all the changes going on. But he because he owns his own business, he is able to call with me every once in a while. Um, mm. It's hard to leave as often as he would like, but if I go out on the road for, say, just one weekend or a four-day fair, it's, it's not that difficult for him to either come with me or to, if I'm doing several weeks in a row, like if I am gone more than three weeks in a row, he typically will hop a plane and come to where I am and rent a car and drive to the fairgrounds and stay two or three days and then come back home again and continue on with his life. So it's not like we stay apart for a long time. And it's fun for me because I get to introduce him to my fair family. And so that makes him more and more comfortable with me out on the road too. 
Do you see the same people at different fairs? A lot. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of entertainers out there. But our paths do crisscross all the time. Sure. And then there are some fairs that hire pretty much the same people year after year. And oh. so those people I see all the time. How did you start out? Were you doing balloon twisting and such? Or what were you doing before? I dabbled a bit with clowning in a costume that I had made for a Halloween party many years ago. And after years went by and I'd pull it out of the closet for this or that or the other thing, I decided I really wanted to learn to do it right. And I got educated in makeup and costuming and comedy and working with different age groups of children. And I did this by going to conventions and I joined our local clown alley. Mm. A couple of these local clowns kind of took me under their wings and showed me the ropes, and they let me tag along to parties and corporate picnics with them. Local yeah. Clown Alley, are there, is that a club, or is there a number of yeah. them in the country? It's a, well, I think there are numbers on some of the alleys. The name of this group was the Funny Business Clowns of Orange County, oh. and unfortunately, that group is no longer in existence, but it was a great bunch of people that were there. Mm. I made some made some friends and some contacts, other people that do it, and finally I got brave enough to go solo, and my relationship with my alter ego, Pickles the Clown, was born. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I actually started with clown ministry at my church, Oh. and I wound up traveling to other churches just by word of mouth for special events, and... Then it was an easy move to include birthday parties and picnics and even wedding reception. How did you go from that to the fairs? One year, the year 2000, my path took a very abrupt turn. This is one of those times where it's not what you know, but who you know. Mm -hmm. In the 2000, I was hired by the Orange County Fair to be part of their clown patrol. Now, the clown patrol back then, basically what they did was just stroll and mainly greet people at the main gate so that people had something fun to do. And some of us would go outside the front gate um, while they were waiting in those huge lines in the sun. It gets hot out there. Oh, it really gets hot out there, yeah. Oh. Um, this was really, really different from anything I'd done before, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I liked it so much, I worked there for 16 years. <laughs> after that, after the first two or three years of being there, I started traveling to some other fairs, working for another entertainer who had like a hands-on kids area. Mm -hmm. And it was hard, but it was really rewarding. And it didn't take long, though, but I wanted to strike out on my own. Well, Anna, yeah. at the time when you were working for someone else, were you doing clowning and, and what were you doing? Well, occasionally I would do my clown character there, but more often than not, I was just sort of like a glorified babysitter. We would set up these big areas with games and crafts and all kinds of things for the kids to do, like a really good place for parents to take their younger kids and the parents could sit down and take a load off, and the kids would be busy. And so I was kind of a glorified babysitter at this, and just watching over things, the equipment, making sure everybody was playing safe. Mm -hmm. So that, was, that wasn't really entertaining, but it was, it was part of what I did back then. And I know this is a little bit off the subject, but uh -huh. during those, did you also book birthday parties and different things from those events? Not from them, because the thing is, when I started doing fairs, I'm traveling, and I'm not local here. And I, even when I was entertaining, and I would have people ask me for a card, I still do to this day, but I can't take gigs like that because they're too far from home. Sure. So I try to find other locals that do kind of what I do, whether it's the clowning or the balloons or the face painting or whatever. And then I can refer them to mm. the people. And frankly, during this same time, I was enjoying the private parties less and less. Oh. Frankly, I wasn't a very good face painter. <laughs> and I was only a so-so magician. <laughs> and balloons were what I really liked. So I changed my focus oh. and the name of my business. And I became Becky's Creations, Balloon Art with a Twist. Gotcha. Now, my little niche was 
I offer lots of different costuming. So I could go to your fair several years in a row, never looking the same. Oh. Um, because I would want to tie in with the theme of the fair. And I was really having a great time doing this. I traveled in my van. I saw parts of the Western United States I would never have seen otherwise. And I met some of the greatest people. So now you're traveling in a van. Yeah. I've seen your whole setup. It's a big, gigantic setup. Now that that comes out of a trailer or something, right? Yeah. Well, I kind of got hooked. <laughs> and in 2004, I got my first RV so mm. I could live right on the fairgrounds because up until then, I was going back and forth to a motel every night or there were even a couple of times where I slept in my van in the RV parking lot and then I would use a friend's RV for change and all that kind of thing. So that's a little a little tougher tougher gig when you're driving in a van and staying in hotels. Yeah. In your van. And, yeah. Honestly, I got to thinking about all the the stuff that goes on and woman traveling alone and all that. And I wasn't real keen on driving back and forth to the fair, back and forth to a motel, because I thought, you know, if somebody's <laughs> watching me, it wouldn't take long for them to figure out my schedule and sure. where I'm going and what time I'm going and all that. So that was kind of how I talked my husband into the RV. He was a little bit nervous about, well, more than a little bit nervous about me driving like that, but he came to understand that once I got where I'm going, I could not be safer because I'm parked with all the entertainers and the vendors and we all know each other and we all take care of each other. So it's, it was the best of all worlds. Right. So now, now how do you travel? Is it in, in the RV or do you have a, you have something else? Or is it no, I have an RV. This is my third one. I keep getting, a, <laughs> I started out with a really small one and then I got a little larger and a little larger. And, and now I have a 32 foot class C RV. When I'm doing my show, I'm pulling a 10 foot trailer behind it Oh, because I have three different shows and problem that I started having is I would do several fairs in a chain and maybe one fair wanted one show and then the next fair wanted the other show and then I and I didn't I couldn't take all the shows with me like that so I got this trailer and I got it wrapped so it's very brightly colored decorated <laughs> and the fairs don't mind it sitting right on the grounds and then I also smartened up and I put an air conditioner on it. Oh, probably this, a good idea. Yeah, the trailer sits then right where my show is, and I can attach my backdrop to it so that I don't have a wind problem because that is definitely something you have to think about at the fairs because it's oh, yeah. almost always outside. And then that's also where I do my show prep in air conditioning. So nice. it really has turned out turned out very well to do it that way. And do you have something that opens up to block the sun also? Because I know whenever I do a city event, that is the one thing that I always fight is the sun. Yeah, you know, I tried it. I, I make a lot of my stuff and I took a shade cloth and I tried to hook it up and I've used it a couple of times when I was desperate, but it tends to kind of droop a little. Mm. Frankly, I always feel kind of bad if I'm covering me and yet the audience is sitting out there in that hot sun. I would almost rather me be in the sun and they be in the shade so they're comfortable. And a lot of fairs are getting it now. Not, not all of them, but they're understanding more and more that they've really got to ha have a comfortable audience or they're not going to hang around. I would think so. Uh, how long is your show? 30 minutes. And typically that's what fair shows are because those are tightly scheduled. Sometimes you're on a stage, sometimes you're not. Uh, when you're on a stage, it's more than likely you're sharing that stage with other people. And so you have to be on and off and they don't like the stages to sit empty. So they have something going on all day long on that stage and you're, you're one of them. Pretty much, pretty much. Now, I'm different in that a lot of people have shows 
that are very quick, set up and tear down. They can almost stroll with their show. In fact, I know a lot of a lot of people that do that, jugglers and magicians in particular. They have their show on wheels and they can just stop anywhere, boom, and start doing their show. Hmm. Mine, I didn't want that. I wanted something that would become part of the scenery at the fairgrounds. So my set goes up and stays up for the entire fair. Your, um, your show, your set looks great. I've seen videos you. of it. And if I was walking by and you weren't even doing your show yet, I'd be, I'd be saying to myself, I, I should probably come back and see this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, looks, it looks great. <laughs> you got all sorts of netting and, and, and then your character fits right in with it and everything. That show that you're talking about is Safari Sadie's Rubber Jungle Review. Yep. And it's all about the rainforest. And it's a balloon show, which is the niche I found because I have not seen or heard of any other shows with a theme like this. There are, there are other people that do balloon shows, but they're not. It's different than mine. Um, and so I kind of found my niche with that. And I started performing that in 2006. It was very well received. And I did over 100 shows that summer, including, this was pretty heady for me. I was just getting started, <laughs> the California State Fair. That was awesome. And I did over 100 shows that summer. Wow. Now, so, how, how, many, how many shows are you doing in a day? Oh, usually three, occasionally four. I will tell you a little funny story about that. When I was first trying to figure out the logistics of doing all this, I wasn't sure how many shows to offer, what to charge for them, all that stuff. And, yeah. and you want to be competitively priced with everybody else, but you don't want to undercut. And it's, so it gets a little tricky. Like any market, if you charge too little, they don't think you're good. If you charge too much, they can't afford you. Well, not only that. Actually, you can't charge too little at the fairs. They will swoop you up. <laughs> oh, really? Because there's budget problems <laughs> everywhere. But the other entertainers aren't going to think too highly of you if you're undercutting everybody. So you want to kind of stay in the same general area. Uh, do you find that, that the you have a balloon show? Do you find that the magicians and the balloon shows and the and the jugglers they all have a tendency to be paid the same, or is there a giant variance? You know what? I can't honestly tell you what other people make because mm. we don't really talk about it. I just know that that fairs have a tendency. They have like a ceiling what they can pay for each type of show. At least this is my understanding. So if you've got like lots of stuff and lots of people and a huge setup and all that, yeah, you're going to command more money than somebody like me or than a, a strolling act. But it just depends on, well, here we go, perceived value. Right. You know? Yeah, that, that's like any market. Yeah. You have to convince them that, that your perceived value is, is, you know, you're worth more than the rest of the people there doing it. I have, uh, I was talking about my two different shows and, and we've sort of been just talking about that first one about the rainforest, but the latest thing I have done is one about agriculture. Oh, that's the, that's the farmtastic adventure. Yeah. And this, this has been so much fun for me because up until now I'd always worked solo, but now I have a partner his name is Virgil McDonald. Ah, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. I saw yeah. a video, animatronic Virgil. Yep. He is the world's oldest farmer <laughs> and he's an Axtell animatronic. Oh. So I am not a ventriloquist by any stretch of the imagination. And so Virgil has his own voice. Mm -hmm. It's recorded and the whole show is tightly scripted on a computer which I have with my equipment there up on stage <laughs> and it's scripted with gaps for me to interject my part. Oh, so it's the next best thing to having a live partner on stage. And it is so much more fun for me because Virgil is always right on cue and he never misses a beat. And if I start to screw <laughs> up, he pulls me back real quick. And the thing is, I don't touch him even once during the show. So it's really cool. The kids love him, but typically the parents come up after the show wanting to know how he works. I'm fascinated by that. I would love to see that. It's very fun. Very, very fun. 
So he just talks by himself. There's no, all you do is you hit the button and start him up and there he goes. Yeah, there are gaps that are in the program. So we have it, we have it recorded in sections. Like there may be a section that we do and he talks, I talk, he talks, I talk. And then maybe there's some audience participation going on. So there's a stop at a certain point. Huh. And then we do the audience participation because, you know, you never know how long that's going to take. Exactly. Right. You can push to get through as quick as possible, but you can't time it. Then I hit the button again, which mm. is pinned to my costume. And it's funny. The button is a different color than my costume, and people don't see it. It's down where I have – well, now I'm telling secrets. <laughs> but it's down, it's down on my pant leg, kind of where my arm hangs. Yeah. And so I just touch that button, and nobody even sees it. Nobody questions, what is that thing hanging from your pants? I never – Never. It's so it's really funny. I have a little button that I use to start and stop my music. I do music during my show. Mm -hmm. It's right on my belt. It's a big black button. It, it, I'm not trying to hide anything, but it's so funny because after the show, the kids go, oh my gosh, I know how you did your music. Like, like they figured something out. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it's right here. It's right on my belt. This is how it works. And I show them. I Well, here's a funny story, and I hadn't even anticipated telling you this, but along this line, when I first started using this little button, this little remote, I was very worried about people seeing it and it being distracting and all that, so I put it in my pocket. Well, what happened was the first time I actually used it, I bent over to pick something up, oh, and no. the button pushed, and bam, we were off and running, and we weren't supposed to be off and running. <laughs> So I learned real quick not to hide it in my pocket because it yes, would get bumped. Just to have it visible and, and make sure it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> now you said three shows. I only have two shows listed. What is you know, the Farmtastic Adventure, the, yeah. the Rubber Jungle Review, and? Well, I created another one called Balloon Mania. And the reason I did this it wasn't, it wasn't planned, actually. I was at a fair. After one of my shows, one of the, somebody in fair management came up and said, tomorrow we're doing school shows. Would you do a school? A, would you be part of the school show? And I said, well, sure. What is that involved? And um, they said, well, we meet over at this big stage and all the entertainers come over and everybody does about 15 minutes to a half an hour. And I went, uh, I can't move all my stuff off this stage. Yeah. And they said, well, can you do something? And so I said, oh, sure. And then I went home and I started sweating bullets oh. um, in my RV. I was going, what the heck am I going to do? <laughs> so I started putting together some little bits and pieces from my other two shows. And then some things that are not in the other two shows, just, just hodgepodge of stuff pulled off the music that I needed for it, because I have a lot of music in my shows too. Mm -hmm. Pulled off the music, put it on my iPod, not iPod, my iPhone actually, mm -hmm. handed it to the sound guy uh, up at the stage the next morning and gave him a sheet of paper with the order I was going to do things and when I wanted him to start the music. After I got, it went really well. Oh. I was so... I was in shock, actually, because I thought, oh, man, here's the end of my career. The sound guy afterward handed my iPhone back to me, and he said, that was one of the best school shows I have ever had to sit through. <laughs> and I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, he said it was great. And so then I thought, you know, this just gives me another little tool to use when I get asked to do impromptu things. Sure. And so I've kept it and have used it occasionally. I don't use it a lot because that's not typically what they're hiring me to do, but it has come in very handy over the years. This is a great lesson. In fact, I was interviewing Dan Chan, uh, the billionaire's magician. And I, I listened to that. Oh, you listened to that one? Okay. I did. Mm -hmm. And remember there was a part where he completely forgot all of his stuff, all of his magic stuff. Oh, gosh. And yes. he ends up doing a show with stuff he bought at the store. He told the client ahead of time and said, well, you know, I'll discount your fee and this and that. 
but it ends up being a terrific show, just like you're telling the same story. And I have almost, a, I have a similar story. It's a great lesson for everybody. If you forget your stuff or if you have to put something together last minute, chances are that show is going to be a fantastic show because it's fresh in your mind. You're going for it and you're doing things you've never done before. And it always seems to turn out great. It was a real hoot. And I was, I was so shocked. You've even put it in your pocket for later now too, right? Yeah, right. Now it does take a little, a little pre-show prep because for all my shows, actually, I do not inflate balloons on the stage. That mm. is so boring. And takes up a lot of time because you got to keep things moving along because you got a half an hour, right? Right. I pre-inflate all the balloons and then I can whoop them together a lot faster. So I have to do that for that show also. But it also gets the kids excited because I use these little pop-up hampers and they're mm -hmm. brightly colored. I walk up on stage with, well, for that show, there's like five hampers full of balloons sticking up out of them and the and it gets the kids really excited they're loving that yeah at that point they don't even care what i'm gonna do they just are hoping they get a balloon so <laughs> and does how big are your audiences i have another question follow-up question but how big are okay. your audiences with those well my show is actually set up, it's a family show, but I typically am not put on a big stage with lots of seating. They put me on a smaller stage. Sometimes the seating is chairs, sometimes it's benches, sometimes it's straw bales. Oh. Also, um, the way I have got my equipment put together, all I basically need is electricity and I can set up anywhere. I can set up right on the ground and just have hay bales out in front of me. The, the crowd really varies. I could have a dozen. I could have standing room only. It, it just really varies. Another thing that, that really affects that is where they put you because I have had happen at some fairs when I was getting started, they put you on a, pay, on a stage or in an area way out in Timbuktu thinking, oh, we'll put her show out here and it'll draw people out to this area. <laughs> well, sometimes that can backfire because they can't find you out in that area. <laughs> right. They, and they so I would wind up, I would wind up, when I saw that that was a distinct possibility, I would wind up going around the fairgrounds and rounding up my audience kind of like the Pied Piper uh -huh. and bringing them back to that area with me in time to start the show. That well, is that, not uncommon. That's a great idea. So that's not against the rules or anything? You can just go through with, with your balloons and have people follow you? Nope, not at all. In fact, the other thing I do is strolling where I'm just making balloons for the people. So I have these different different categories that I can fall into and sometimes the fairs just hire me to be a stroller and no show at all. Oh. Um, they're all used to that. The only cardinal rule would be not to go to somebody else's show and try to steal their audience. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that would That's... not be good. <laughs> That'd just be disrespectful, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you have the entire audience and you bring enough balloons for everybody. Do you look out beforehand or how does that work? No, actually, everybody does not get a balloon. Oh. The only ones who for sure get a balloon are the people that help me on stage. Oh, I may make something for them, or like with my farm show, I make little balloon apples and I have them in a big bushel basket. And everybody who helps me on stage, they get a packet of Farmtastic Adventure seeds, um. actual seeds. They get one of those and they get a little balloon apple to take back to their seat. And that gets, um, gets people even more excited about volunteering, right? Yeah. Sometimes the very first one is a little hesitant. So if I'm real careful who the first one is I choose and then the rest of the kids find out that they're actually getting something, I have no problem getting volunteers for the rest of the show. Do, do you have any say on where they put you? You talked about sometimes they'll put you in the boondocks. Do you have any say of where they put you? Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Sometimes you're hired with a specific place in mind and you just have to make the best of it. Mm. You can make suggestions. There was one fair I was in like three or four. I did it four years in a row and I think I was in four different locations because they were trying different things. Um, one of them, it was too hot. 
one of them it was too close to another stage that was really noisy there were lots of bands on it which is another thing that we have to deal with um, whose sound system is oh. louder <laughs> yeah and then I went out in a beautiful spot under a tree, and I thought, I'm an eye shot of people walking by. I can get their attention. Nope. Oh. <laughs> I had to go gather up my crowd for that one, too. So, <laughs> and, and it was my suggestion that I try it out there because I just saw how comfortable the audience would be under this huge tree. Didn't work out right. So I was doing a show in Las Vegas a few years ago. The wind was so crazy. It was so hot, so windy that I, I think I had three shows scheduled and I did one and then they canceled the other two because it was so windy. Do you ever fall into that? Oh man, I have some awful stories. And you know what? You asked me for a, a possible horror story and yeah. I didn't even put this one in there, but there was one fair I did and I, I have to do my setup the day before fair opens. They put me out in the middle of a big open area kind of in the middle of fairgrounds it was between the carnival between the food vendors it wasn't a bad spot for traffic right. actually but there was no shelter and it was my first time there uh, it was in Ridgecrest have you ever been to Ridgecrest is that up, up in the mountains or no it's a flat area but it's windy oh. really windy and I didn't know so I set up everything. The next morning, I went down to, um, and I, I had heard the wind blowing a little, but I thought, okay, I've got extra on everything, and we're, we're good to go here. I went down the next morning, and half of my set was laying on the ground. No. And I had a speaker that had fallen over. Mm. So I put it back up again, and I lashed it even better. And by the end of the day, I was worried that it was going to go down again. So I told them, and I said, you know what? I can't stay out here. I said, because I can't start losing equipment. This is, I'll be paying out way more than you folks are, can pay me to be here. They put me up beside a building. They said, this is great. The wind always comes from this direction. So you will be sheltered here. This will be great. Of course. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, the next morning I went down the wind had changed direction and the set was down on the ground again. And this was, and I had gone down like seven o'clock on a Sunday morning and this was the last day of the fair. And I thought, Oh, this is nuts. I'm we're done. And I took everything down, put it back in the trailer and went in the office. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do strolling for you for the rest of the fair because oh, yeah. I, it was just awful. And yeah. nobody's comfortable. Nobody's going to nope. come if, if, if it's that windy, nobody's going to come see the show anyway. Right. right. And think about this. I'm working with balloons here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would be all over the fairground. <laughs> oh. Well, what, is a, what does a typical day look like when, you know, you arrive at the fair and you set up the night before or the day before, and then it's show day? Well, you get up early because I have show prep. Before my first show of the day, I have about an hour prep I have to do, getting everything put together. And then some fairs are much more scheduled than others. Now, the shows are always scheduled. Mm -hmm. You have a certain stop and start time for them. Strolling, not so much. Sometimes they schedule that. Sometimes they just say, go with it because... They trust you. They know you're going to be where you need to be, when you need to be there, when you can affect the most people. When you're a stroller, you're not necessarily going out there the minute the gate opens because there may not be anybody there for a while. Right. Which is also another thing you deal with when you're doing a show. And if they schedule you right at opening and there's nobody on the grounds yet, you know, that, that gets a little complicated. But. Yeah, I love that. And that, that's any show too. Yeah. I do a lot of school assemblies and, and they'll mm -hmm. say, oh, we'll start at eight o'clock. And I'll say, when does school start? And they'll say eight o'clock. And I'll say, <laughs> let's start at 8.15 or 8.30. Uh -huh. I'm sure it's the same yeah. with fairs, right? Yeah. Except usually we don't get a say in the start. We can request start times but they're you have to keep in mind they're juggling a lot of different acts and I think for the most part they try not to schedule people at the same time they want things to 
not overlap necessarily one and then the next hour another and then another and then another so you don't usually get a whole lot of choice when your show is scheduled so a typical day or week can really be different from fair to fair mm. like I mentioned the shows are 30 but usually 30 minutes because if you're sharing a stage you need time to set up and tear down sure. and you have you want to be courteous of the other performers Sometimes breaks are catch as catch can. Other times breaks are scheduled. There may or may not be a break room for you to go to. Uh, but, uh, but, you, but now you have your RV. But now I have my RV. And also I have, if I'm doing shows, I have my trailer. Oh. So, which is air conditioned, as I mentioned. So that's a great place for me to go if I need to get away from people. And there isn't really a place for me to do that. So you're styling. Oh, yeah. I'm having a blast. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> now, after, after your show, so you do your 30-minute show, and I was noticing in one of the videos that you were making hats for kids or something. Do you stay after the show, or is, is it just now show? Well, it depends now. If nobody is needing my area right after I'm done, I especially with that one particular show, the, the way the Rainforest show ends is I have two parents come up on stage and they each bring a child and I teach them how to make a balloon hat. And then I put this big barrel full of balloons between the two of them. They each try to make a crazy balloon hat. <laughs> now, sometimes this is hysterical and sometimes they really get into it and other times they are just mortified that they have to do this but while they're doing this and the kids are getting all excited and the kids get to hand them the colors that they want and I'm, I said you know these things can, can be as big as a parade float if you want just there's no rhyme or reason and there's no wrong way to do this we're just gonna have fun here and then I'm singing this crazy song at the end of that when they're done all the balloons that are left over, plus another big deal. I don't know if you, you know the balloons, they come in different sizes. Well, sure. they're using 260s. And I have a whole big batch of 350s mm. that I've hidden. I toss, I, I, we call it a balloon barrage. I at the end, very end of the show, I do a balloon barrage with all of those 250s that are left in the barrel. And I just zing them out to the audience make them oh, fly kids are loving that yeah they're screaming they're, it's really crazy that bin gets emptied quite quickly because these other people have been using them and i go all finished or are, are, are we done now and oh no no way <laughs> and i grab this other one that i have hidden and there's just a gasp because these are the big balloons, right? And then I throw all those out there, and that's how the show ends. Well, if I have time, if nobody is waiting to use my space, I come back out on stage at the very end, tell them if, if they would like me to make something for them out of those balloons, I will. And so I just do super quick one or two balloon hats for them. Not anything fancy. It's the basic hat, and then I just add another one to a like bug ears or you know something, something real quick. super something super fast that's always really cool because the kids get so excited and then sometimes I'm doing a combo at the fairs so I'm doing some shows some strolling and so boy you can bet your bottom dollar they're looking for me out on the grounds after that to get something a little more even a little more exciting a little more to fancy show me that look I've still got my hat so it's fun it's fun. Oh. I do that when I can. <laughs> We're going to get to, <clears throat> I, I put on the Facebook page that you're going to drop a bombshell on us. And we're going to get to that in just one second. But, but, but before we do that, uh, you, have, you said you have one more horror story. Oh, Another good horror story. Okay. I have a million of them. I know. Some of them I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> there are some of them that, no, if anybody ever wants to get into this, they don't want to hear this. Um, <laughs> Honest, though, I've been really fortunate. Uh, there have been a few. Uh, there are the typical equipment malfunctions. Mm -hmm. Once I had a drunk lady run up on stage, she was determined she was going to be part of the show. Oh, yeah. 
I have a very vivid memory of one that actually didn't happen at a fair, though. It happened at a circus. Oh. Um, a clown friend and I were up north doing pre-opening shows at a mall for the Carson Barnes Circus. And at the mall, we were having a costume competition for the kids to dress up as clowns. And pick, we picked three winners, and they got to come to the circus for free in costume, go into the center ring, and be introduced by the ringmaster. Big uh, deal, right? Yeah. So my friend and I, we judged. We picked the three. We were to take them out into the center ring. They all came in their cute little costumes. And we had to take them out there at a, um, a certain time during the show between acts. Well, nobody told the orchestra about this little addition. <sighs> we got out to the center ring. The ringmaster announced their names. And the orchestra started playing the music for the elephants to come out. Oh, no. And there were 20 elephants. <gasps> The elephants did not come slowly walking. They were running in a big line. And then they broke into small groups so that they could enter each ring and go round and round. There we were standing in the middle of the center ring, and we were stuck. We didn't have anywhere to go. My friend and I looked at each other because those elephants are really big when you're standing that close. Oh, yeah, and you're standing there with three non- Three little kids, Yeah. So we, grab, we looked at each other, we grabbed the kids' hands, and we jumped up on top of the ring. <laughs> so these elephants are walking past us. We could have reached out and touched them. They were that close, and we were just <gasps> freaking out, but trying to stay calm for the children, you know, and only imagining what their parents were thinking. Thinking, uh, saying, oh, this is all part of the show. Yeah. Well, as soon as the elephants had all gotten into their respective rings, there was a little gap, and we ran like heck to get out of there. We were shaking like crazy, and now we were looking at their parents' faces, who looked horrified. I decided on that day that the circus was not my calling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty scary. That is way scarier than any horror story I have. <laughs> mine, are about, mine are about, you know, kids and parents and stuff. Not, not elephants. <laughs> All right, so let's get to this bombshell. So, oh, uh, geez. <laughs> so uh, what's going on, Becky Goodyear? Oh, God. All right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> this long pause is building suspense. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, how do we do this? Uh, bombshell. I'm not sure this is going to live up to the term, bombshell. Well, for me, it is. Okay, okay, because you'd already know it. All right. You have caught me at an interesting time in my life. Mm -hmm. Years ago, it would this my talk would have been very very different. But now, um, I have in my heart, in my mind, many if not most of the people listening to this are probably working really hard to build their businesses and get more gigs and expand and explode and you know. And yep. I'm kind of on the other side of that. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> and for the last couple of years, I've been working on a retirement plan. Mm. The R word. Yeah. Scares the bejeebies out of me to think of it. But I have committed to continue performing this year and next year. But after that, I would like to sell my shows and then go back to just strolling at a small number of fairs and spend more time with my husband, my kids, my grandkids. Uh -huh. So I guess the bombshell part of this might be that this would be a terrific opportunity for somebody because all the scripting, recording, props, sound equipment, and an air-conditioned trailer to haul it in would be in the deal. So you're talking about a complete show or uh, more than one show? Both of my shows. Both? And everything. Shows. They, If they learned the script, they could walk up and they're good to go. I'll also be happy to take that person to convention because we haven't even talked about that yet, but that's the main way that we 
get people to know us, what we yes. do, who we are, how we promote ourselves is at a convention. As at, there are several different conventions, actually. Yeah, that is one of the fan questions, as a matter yeah. of fact. So, we'll, so all they would have to do is learn the lines and run with it. And they wouldn't have to be a balloon artist either because I don't do anything really complicated. I can teach them that part. But it would be a plus if they were somewhat musical because I do a little singing in the shows. Mm. They could also go to some of the fairs with me in 2019 and watch and learn and perform themselves. And do, does your partner, Animatronic Virgil, come with that? You betcha. Ooh. Yep. So you're talking about the RV, all the props. No, 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 not all, the RV. Oh. The RV I'm going to keep. Okay. Um, but the the trailer that would house the show, that I transport the show in. Okay. Um, and and all the props, sound equipment, every. Thing. The scripting, the sound equipment. The, yep. The and I would also, if there were, like, if a woman took it over, wouldn't have to change anything. If a man would, there would have to be a little bit of rescripting done. Just mainly, the biggest part would be the gentleman who did Virgil's voice for me. Some of that would have to be re-recorded because he actually uses my name occasionally. My name oh. is Sadie. So that wouldn't work if, if, if a fellow wanted to do it. But the show would be perfectly fine for a fellow to do it. But that'd be a pr pretty quick fix. Mm-hmm. I think so. And he would be, he's very easy to work with and he would, he would be happy to do it, I'm sure. That is an amazing opportunity so. because you're talking about years and years of, of working out routines and, and working on props and, and creating scripting. <laughs> I wish I had this opportunity when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm, I'm basically looking for a mini me uh -huh. pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is wonderful. That's an amazing bombshell. That is terrific. I'm excited for the person who's going to be taking over. Or mm. for, and I'm excited for your new adventure, too. These are all chapters in our life, right? Right. Right. And you're just going into the next chapter. Yeah. I don't know what that's going to be, but I'm up for it. I'm not ready for a rocking chair yet. Yeah. Yeah. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into some of those fan questions since we, we already dropped the bombshell, talked a lot about fairs and festivals. Uh, every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook page that you can ask them questions, that a person can post questions there and I will ask the person okay. I'm interviewing. Okay. And by the way, I also put a nice little link to any entertainer that asks the questions to their website. So if you do ask a question, you know, I'll put it on my website and I'll put your name there and, and a backlink. Nice. Let's get to these questions. Brett, uh, Brett Bolich, Bretso the Great, a magician out of Orange County, our hometown, asks a few different questions. First, uh, something you alluded to just a second ago, do you go to showcases for fairs, festivals, and how do they differ from, uh, from library showcases? I do, but they're not called. Showcasing is just a little part of what happens at these conventions. You have to get your face out there. You can send a gazillion pieces of material to the fairs and they could end up in the wastebasket. They get so much stuff from people. They want to see what they're getting. So you really need to go to the conventions and there are many different ones depending on what area you would like to perform. Do they so, have uh, in this convention, do you get to perform or do you have a booth or how does that look? Well, you buy a trade show booth and so you set it all up. Trade show is usually a couple of days for a certain, a certain amount of hours each day. But there are other things that go on at convention too. A lot of classes and round tables and also social events. You need to get involved. If you go and just stand around in your trade show booth, which I did for a couple of years because mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. Yeah. And then you wonder why people are not knocking down your door. To The fair industry is different from like the birthday party or the restaurant gig or something that you would, a gig that you would get maybe year after year. It's different. It is based a lot on relationships. Mm. They don't just want to know what you do and get excited about it. They want to know how you handle yourself. You're, you're, a, you're the face of the fair sometimes. People look at you and if they get a bad taste in their mouth, 
they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth for the fair. Yeah, makes so sense. So we do all we can do to make the fair look good, basically, is why we're there. Entertain the people, yes, but there's a lot of different facets to what we do. So getting back to showcasing, part of every convention, every one that I've gone to, they have showcases. The convention that I go to mostly, there are two days of trade shows, but the showcases are at night in a big ballroom on a big stage. There is alcohol that's flowing. Right. It's very social. Everybody's hobnobbing. The entertainers that get up on the stage are typically bands. It just lends itself more to that because they're loud and they're big and people like to dance and little shows like mine would not do well. Mm. And also I've got too much stuff, too much set up tear down. I couldn't give them a really good picture and I'm dealing with children. There aren't children there. Very few. Some people bring their families, but it just wouldn't lend itself to that. Having said that, I have also seen jugglers and magicians and dance teams. Uh, I have a friend who does, uh, she's a cowgirl and she does rope tricks, yep. that kind of stuff. They can make that work on the big stage. Right. What I do, I can't. Is this, a, they, is this a national convention? Are there a lot of fairs and festivals or people in charge of them coming from all over the United States or are they specific to a state? There is a huge one that is once a year. It is IAFE. And up until this year, including this year, it's been in Las Vegas every year. I don't go to that one because people from all over the United States, and I think even across the ocean, come to that. When I tried doing that one, the fairs that were interested in me were so scattered, the times and the dates, and I just thought, I can't travel cross country for one fair. I yeah. you know, I just wasn't comfortable. That wasn't a fit for me. The one I go to is called the Western Fair Association. Mm -hmm. And typically fairs that are represented are probably by far California, but also Oregon, Washington, Arizona, um, New Western. Mexico, at the Western part of the United States, that one I'm comfortable with. And frankly, there's plenty of work for people to do it. You don't have to travel all around. If I had a smaller setup and I could fly to where I was going, oh, yeah. then I, I could be zigzagging all over the United States, but that's not my setup and it's not a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. So you do with what, where you're comfortable. I have a lot of friends that do, they fly all over the place and do some amazing things. There are also conventions that are even more central like than that. I know Oregon has their own convention. Colorado has their own. There's another one that is um, the mountain states have one. Montana, Wyoming, North and South Dakota, Colorado, they all go to that one. So it just depends on where you'd like to work. So you could probably Google fair conventions or probably. something. And have them in your area mm -hmm. find out what your area is or mm -hmm. wherever you want to travel to. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a membership. At least I think you have to have a membership what, to, what, to be in the trade shows and go to these conventions. What is the membership? What is the membership? I mean, is it, is it for some association? What is the name of the association? Well, the one that I go to out here is the Western Fair Association. Oh, I see. So you have to have a membership to the Western Fair Association. Yeah, to the main organization. And then... It you get all kinds of goodies. You get a directory that's got, I call it the fair Bible. It's got everything in it and you, you advertise in it and you see, you get it at convention, which their convention is in January. Do you get it then? And it has all the fairs and all the dates for the whole next year. Wow. They have a website. Um, mm -hmm. It's so it's very informative. It's a have to, you just that really need to have this book. That's uh, amazing information. <laughs> like we're up on our hour, but but do you have a few more minutes? Can you can you spend with us? I got time, sure. Okay, okay. Then um, we'll we'll go on to some more questions. Brett So the Magnificent, Brett So the Great, also asked, "How do you deal with fairs and festivals that have performers that have tenure 
in your niche. You mentioned that a little bit, mm -hmm. that some fairs and festivals hire the same people over and over. Do you okay. see that a lot? How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I don't even know that tenured is the correct term to use. Fairs are not like a restaurant or a gig that you might do get just get every year that that they are loyal to you. Each year is brand spanking new and they're always looking for fresh and different entertainment because you figure would you go to the fair every year? Some of these little ones, especially if it was same old, same old every year, you want to see something different. So some fairs hire lots of the same people and only change up a few key acts. Mm. Others change up a lot and only, ha only have a few that they have back every year. And others change everything. <laughs> yeah, and then there are some that change every other year. You have to keep your face out, out there. And if you don't get hired back, you can't take it personally unless you really have done something that they don't want you there anymore. <laughs> but it can also be about budget. Uh -huh. Now, having said that, if I asked a fair about coming, let's say they came to my trade show booth and we were talking and I found out that they already had a balloon artist, I would never, ever, ever push my strolling if that's what the person did. I would talk about my shows because mm. it's different. And there is another balloon artist uh, on the fair circuit, and he and I have worked together quite often, <laughs> but we don't do the same thing. He does strolling, um, he can do voice of the fair, he has a penny farthing bicycle, and so I might do my show at that fair. Or there have been fairs that I've done that, and he has only done the voice of the fair. So we try not to step on toes, but yet you want to make yourself available if they're wanting to make a change. So it's a little, it's a little, you just have to be careful because you don't, want to do anything yeah that's like any market you find out who's going to be there mm -hmm. uh, i've been i've been hired for events where they have five or six different entertainers and if they have another magician i'll i'll say well let let them go at the beginning of the event or the end of the event let's separate us by five or six different types of acts yeah so that way it's not two magicians in a row mm-hmm mm -hmm. uh well brett also asked do you do back of the room sales at all I don't do it myself. I kind of tossed it around, but I know many people who do. If you're going to do that, you just need to let the fair know when you're negotiating your contract with them. Some fairs don't even care, and they say, yep, go for it. Others don't want you to do it at all, and others say, yes, you can do it, but they charge you a percentage of your sales uh -huh. that you have to pay back to them. So that's kind of how that works. Gotcha. I know in the school uh, in the school market, one of the strategies that we use is if we do back of the room sales, we will give back to the school a certain percentage of the sales. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's a good way of selling it. Mm -hmm. All right. So Ryan Price, uh, a magician out of Manitoba, Canada, asks, "I would like to know about routing." Oh. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, it's really hard when you're first getting started because you don't know where the heck these places are. I mean, I actually took a map and I circled where every single fair was on the map because if you don't know where they are and you get two in a row and they're really far apart, you got to know about your drive time. You've got to know how many days you have to get from one to the other. And it's, you find yourself all over the map and you're wasting a lot of fuel. Yeah. So let's say I'm invited to a fair and it's very far away, um, maybe even in another state, and I'm not familiar with it. Often, if you have nothing else going on before or after, instead of making a trip clear out there for just that one, if they want you badly enough, they that manager will hook you up with another fair that's in closer to them, maybe just before or just after their fair. And then going that distance isn't such a hardship because you're doing two in a row. Oh. So lots of times the fair managers will work with you like that. That makes sense. Yep. And then you're doing two or three. Mm-hmm. Annie Banani, you, you, I think you know Annie Banani. I know Annie Banani. 
<laughs> in fact, first time I met you, I think it was with Annie Banani uh, <laughs> going for sushi, right? Oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So she asked, I think we kind of already went over that, but I'll give her a shout out anyway. For those of you that don't know Annie Banani, she's, she's an amazing balloon artist out of the Southern California area. Mm -hmm. She uh, says, please ask her to describe the life of a fair performer, which we've kind of yeah, I think we've kind of done for someone who might want to pursue that market. I think we, we kind of went over that, right? We did. I, I just, let me add to that though, that you have to be very flexible and probably part gypsy. <laughs> um, Cause you never know with what or with who you are going to be dealing. Um, stage, no stage, schedule changes, uh, occasional drunk, oh. you have allergies because there's lots of straw hay and animals around, media interviews, runaway bulls. And I'm not kidding about that one. One day a bull got away from a teenage handler and oh. ran through the RV parking. It freaked and there was no stopping it. So that was weird. Set up, tear down, drive, set up, tear down, drive. But I wouldn't change a thing. I've made a lifetime of friends and they're my fair family, really family. We take care of each other. I mentioned earlier, my husband was a little concerned about me being out on the highway, but he now knows because he's met a bunch of these people that when I get where I'm going, I'm in good hands because there's no better people walking this earth than fair people. I'm here to tell you. That's sweet. I love entertainer people. It's what I do and I love being around them. All right. So Jonathan Fudge, uh, owner and operator of Your Total Entertainment out of Tampa, Florida asks, um, I'd be interested in marketing tips for fairs and festivals and how the clientele uh, differs from other industries. I think I touched on this a little bit too. You can send stuff like crazy. You can make phone calls and email, but the truth of the matter is getting hired may take a while mm -hmm. unless you have something crazy different and they see that you're a perfect fit for their theme. Normally they want to get to know you a little bit. Uh -huh. Relationships are really key. So first of all, like I mentioned, you need to show your face and, and get involved at a convention. The perfect place to start, right? Right. Absolutely. Go to the social things at convention cl and classes and lectures and roundtables and let people get to know who you are and not just what you do. Jonathan also asks, I'd also be interested in what she feels is the most important thing to them. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it promoting the fair? Is it the show itself? What do you think? I read Jonathan's question. And he put down things like uniqueness, visuals, skills, yeah. professionalism. And to that, I say, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. I would also add energy and reliability. And here's a weird thing. This might be a good spot to add that doing a show at a fair is very different than a library or a school or a birthday party. You don't have your crowd right there. You don't have them contained. You may or may not have anybody waiting for you when you start. Oh. You may start your show and there's one person sitting out there. Your location may not be all that great. And so when you begin, you have to be all of the above to get oh. that crowd in. And then you have to keep them because if they don't like what they see or they are uninvolved, they will just get up and walk away. So sometimes it's almost like a trade show. You have to actually help to gather people around. You got to hook them. Yep. The shows are quite often outside. So, and there's so much going on at a fairground. So you're also dealing with squirrel, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and people can come and go as they please. Yep. Yeah. And they do. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan also asks, traveling what type of experiences do you encounter any suggestions for those that travel on comfort or keeping costs down you know well one versus the other it costs to be comfortable mm. i guess that's all i can say before i got my rv i stayed at local motels i mentioned that yep. um, i slept in my van a couple of times and used a friend's rv there to change in the beginning Local motels would be, your room would be provided by the fair as part of your compensation. So that wasn't so bad. But the fairs have had huge budget cuts over the last few years. Oh. And there are a lot less fairs than, that can afford motels for their 
sure. entertainers. Not all. Some still do. So for me, RVing is the way to go. It's so much more comfortable. I don't mind using truck stops and rest areas because the only, they're the only option for me for gas because my RV is 32 feet long. And when I'm doing a show, I'm pulling a 10-foot trailer. Yeah. So also travel is a little slower. This is all the downside. I have to count for longer travel time. And I do not travel at night. This is just me. A lot of them do, but I won't. Mm. So, of course, there, and then there are possible mechanical problems. But I love my RV. It's my home away from home. And paying for more fuel but being able to bring my own food is a real plus. Fair Wonderful food day. is expensive, and I would weigh 500 pounds. <laughs> So, oh, and the other biggie is I don't have to use gas station restrooms. And you mentioned it before, no worries if there's not a break room because I've got my home there. Right. You just jump on in. Yeah. Oh, and then I get to bring my dogs. I have two little dogs that travel with me. <laughs> well, that's important. I yeah. have a dog myself. I know how important that is. We hike every weekend. I love having him around. Uh -huh. It's very comforting and it is not as lonely because they're with me. Yeah, and you're traveling alone, uh, but, but with two, a, a couple of dogs, you're not really traveling alone. Right. Uh, Eddie Rice is a, an actor and clown out of L.A. He asks a number of questions we've kind of already gone over, but uh, one of the questions that he has is, do fairs ever have a budget to, to fly somebody in? Yep, some of them do, and they do. Typically, it's the bigger fairs. Um, I have a friend who lives in Texas, and he works – all over the place, all over the place. Yeah, some of them do. The little ones, probably not. So you're better off if you want to do with the smaller ones uh, yeah. to have, have an RV and travel. And frankly, the smaller ones are my favorite. The people are so appreciative. Oh. And, you know, a lot of these little places, the kids save all year for the fair because this is the big deal. Some of these little fairs, they buy a pass, and you see the same faces every single day. Hmm. It's, it's just the big entertainment for them. Well, so sometimes as entertainers, we forget those things that, you know, we're doing it all of the time. So to us, doing a show sometimes is no big deal. Mm -hmm. But like you're saying, some kids, you know, they save up for the entire year, and they look forward to this the entire year. Yep. We need to respect that and know that we are affecting them in a, in a wonderful, amazing way. And being the smaller shows, like I am, and you would, you would be considered a smaller show instead of this huge stage show production, we actually have contact with them. We talk to them. We shake their hands. We say, hey, how you doing? Did you like the show? Um, hey, you were a great helper on stage. And the kids remember that. Man, I come, I come back to a fair that I've been at the year before, and the kids will come running up to me and say, hey, remember me? Remember me? You know. <laughs> of course I do. Yeah. And the little fairs, I just love them. Do you have any advice for, for the beginner, the person that's just getting into the fair and festival market? Yeah. Um, be patient. Be flexible. If I had to keep it really short, many years ago, we had, I think this is really huge because this information has stayed with me for many, many years. We had a lecture at the Orange County Magic Club, and I never forgot it because he talked about the value of having another professional critique your show. Because hmm. so often we self produce yep. and we miss important things that can make our show so much better. Maybe something you shouldn't be doing, maybe something to add. And I'm not talking about a friend or a family man or member who's going to tell you what you want to hear. We need somebody who doesn't have any skin in the game and they'll be totally honest with you. And yes, that is scary, but it's really worth it in the end. You need to make sure you have a product they're going to want. Make friends with the other entertainers. They can be so helpful. Do not be a lone wolf. You need to get to know them because they're going to tell you places that you could slip up or things to watch out for. Maybe they've been doing that fair for several years and they'll give you a heads up on things. Case in point, yes. there is an entertainer and I just love him. I don't know him that well because our paths don't seem to cross that much, but his name is Steve Hamilton and he is called Steve the Pretty Good. 
he's a magician, but he's so much more. He also does strolling and crazy, crazy, crazy things. Well, he was walking across the fairgrounds one day and he stopped to watch one of my shows in progress. And it was the farm show with Virgil. I was singing and making a balloon chicken at that moment. <laughs> he caught up to me later and said, why don't you, when you, pre when you present it that it's finished, be shocked because it lays an egg. <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, so simple, very effective, and I wouldn't have thought of doing that in a million years. I started doing that. I got one of those wooden eggs, yep. and I palm it, and it drops out of the bottom of the chicken. The kids go crazy. I'm sure. So, And I would never, had, had I never taken his advice and listened to him and gotten to know him a little bit, it never would have happened. Yeah, you get that outside eye that hasn't seen it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and they, they have a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, how about the working pro? Do you have any advice for the working pro, the person that, that has been doing it for a while? Do not burn the candle at both ends. Mm. Some people, when they get into the fairs, they try to do too much. Don't take breaks. They try to, then they go out and, and do things at night and then they come in and they're blurry eyed in the morning and you need to get enough rest, drink lots. And I mean lots of water because it's hot out there. Mm. But probably the neatest thing is to be a mentor to one of the beginners. Oh. I interpreted that a little different. You meant for a seasoned pro who wanted to become involved in fairs. I was thinking about the seasoned pro that's already in fairs. It's great to have a mentor with any market because they can help you skip right to the places that you want to be, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. And they can help you avoid some of the pitfalls. You know, why reinvent the wheel? Exactly. And if you can be a mentor for somebody starting out or even somebody who's been working and isn't familiar with your particular fair or festival that you've worked for a bunch of times, it can help them a lot. I would not be where I am right now without some many wonderful mentors. One guy told me he'd been working with me, and this was my first year, and I was having a terrible time. And I called him at night. I said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, boot camp, girly, boot camp. He says, if you can get through this, you can do anything. And by golly, I did. He didn't give me any, any, any. He just said it like it was. You want to do this? Get used to it, girly. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, before we let you go, give us one book recommendation and tell us why. Okay. There are many that I could recommend because my reading list has been as different as all the different chapters in my life. So I'll tell you what I'm reading right now, and I've just started it. So I, I can't give you the whole thing, but I know where it's headed, I think. I'm winding down my career ever so slowly, and that is really scary for me because I've always been a real busy person. Yep. I am not ready for a rocking chair by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm reading a book by Brian Houston, and it's called There Is More. Oh. When the world says you can't, God says you can. Mm. And it's not talking about accumulating more stuff or more fame or more anything like that. It's talking about fulfilling your unique purpose and calling no matter where you are in life and how important it is to continue to dream and to dream big. Nice. And where I'm reading in it right now, it's talking about surrounding yourself with other dreamers and not letting your dreams die. He gives an example. Do you know Winston Churchill was 65 years old when he became prime minister? Right. Heck, he was starting a whole new chapter to live out. So I'm just excited to find out what my ne next chapter is going to be. I'm excited for your next chapter. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Becky, so much for doing my podcast. So where, where can somebody get a hold of you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. Okay. Becky Lowry Goodyear. It's just a personal page, um, but I talk about my traveling, and you can get a hold of me that way. I have a website. It's called Becky's Creations.com. Right. There's phone number and email and all that stuff is on that. So, and boy, anybody who's even curious about going out on the fair circuit, um, going 
you know, possibly purchasing my show or doing Ooh. something totally different, I'm really happy to answer questions. Let me mention really fast, too, yes. that there is another podcast. I don't know if he's doing it right now, but he's been doing it for the last couple of years. Um, the gentleman's name is Alan Bruce, and he has a podcast called Tailgate Entertainers. Mm. And every single podcast is people that travel, mostly maybe not all, but mostly fair people. You can get some more great ideas from that. So if you're interested in jumping into this market and traveling for your show, that would be a great podcast to listen to. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Becky. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, uh, tell a friend. That's how, we, uh, that's how we can spread the word. And feel free to reach me at john at thevarietyartist.com or join my Facebook group where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Or on Twitter, I am at The Variety Artists. There's no T at the end because there wasn't room. Or visit my website at www.thevarietyartists.com. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. Thanks again, Becky. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.